We start with Tariq Al Aris, uh, who's uh, an associate professor of Middle Eastern studies at Dartmouth uh, College and associate editor of the Journal of Arabic Literature. He is the author of Trials of Arab Modernity, Literary Affects and the New Political, and editor of the Arab Renaissance, a bilingual anthology of the Nahda. His forthcoming book, The Leaking Subject, Arab Culture in the Digital Age, examines the way that cyber modes of confrontation, circulation, and exhibitionism shape contemporary cultural practices and critiques of power. Tfadal Tariq. Thank you. Thank you, Rana. Thank you all. Uh, I would like to start with the title of this uh, panel, uh, The Ties That Bond. And of course, when we think of ties, we think of uh, molecules, we think of atoms, we think of things coming together and separating. We think also of cords, like umbilical cords. We also think of ropes, ropes that you can throw to someone to save them, but also that you can use also to tie them up, or a rope that could be used to hang oneself. <laughs> so, so the title of this talk, which seems like about food and community and, and community coming together around food, is a, a very treacherous title. It is perhaps also about bondage. It is people being tied up because they like it or being tied up against their will. So what I want to talk about today and develop uh, an essay I wrote already for Tamawuj as part of the Sharjah Biennial uh, called Mfat uh, toil, toil and Trouble. What I would like to develop is, is this notion of community and also think about the sadomasochistic rituals of community. And, and to look also about the political implications of these rituals that uh, that are centered around food, cooking, coming together, but also about the ties that bond. So when Christine asked me to think about food and, and Beirut as part of this program, the first thing that came to my mind is uh, a dish called mfatta. This is the most really iconic Beiruti dish. It is almost extinct. Uh, you can buy it uh, at this place called Makari and Hashim in Basta Tahta, in this you know neighborhood close to Zal Blat, uh, under the bridge. Uh, under the bridge, there is also the mosque where a lot of Beirutis go to be prayed upon before they are carried to the burial in Beshura, to the cemetery in Beshura. So it is really a dish and, and associated with, with a place of, of origin, but also of, of death. And, it is, and also of a community that is, uh, to say the least, in crisis. Uh, because of many, many reasons, uh, from Solidaire, from the current political uh, transformations. It's, it's a community that is that has to rethink itself, that has to rethink its place, its relation to the city, uh, and whether the city continues to provide this Beiruti community with its identity, uh, and of course through particular rituals. And and Mfatta I'm making is is definitely one of those. Uh, and this is. Jana Travolsi's illustration of a little graphic novel called Halwe uh, Fatta. <laughs> Although I'm not sure, you know, of course she captures the, the yellowness of the Mfatta uh, in, this, in this little booklet. So, so why Mfatta? I mean, Mfatta, what does Mfatta mean? Mfatta literally means the ripped one. Fit, fatq in Arabic, to rip. Uh, and of course, here we think of a rip. We think, you know, I'm coming from, you know, philosophy and literary theory. I think of the makeup of the subject in Lacan of sutures and the undoing of the sutures. 
that bring, that give the subject, the individual, its identity, what Lacan calls méconnaissance. So, so there is something in fatta that is literally about the unmaking, about the ripping. But of course, in fatta tifti in Beiruti Arabic, it fatta it means to crave. It means to crave something so much that it rips something in that which is craved and in the one craving it. So there is, it is not any desire. It is not any craving. It's a craving that comes at a great price, at a price of an undoing of a particular subject, of a particular identity, of a particular recognition of an object of desire. So, so when I was thinking about Mfat, I felt like something really also ripped in me. I mean, something opened, something uh, into a, a family unconscious, but also into a cultural unconscious, into the unconscious really of the city. And, and of course we cannot think, there's a lot of talk today again about the city, about Beirut, uh, about museums, about heritage, about culture, but how can we think of the city outside of the personal, outside, how can we keep the personal and the cultural really simultaneous in our investigation. We cannot, ob otherwise we risk objectifying and, and reifying the history and the culture of the city. So, so this rip w was something very painful and very powerful that I experienced thinking about having to talk about Beirut and food and Fatta. And Fatta was the rip, was also the possibility of thinking about community in this context. So I started having this voice in my head. I started hearing this phrase when I was about to sit down and, and write this, this piece that I wrote in, in March and April. Uh, I started hearing this voice. Her name was Shafia. Her name was Shafia. Her name was Shafia. It's almost like an evil spirit that came to me. Something opened, and in that opening, in that rip, this evil spirit came to me and grabbed me and started calling its name, calling my name, and I knew this is how I was going to start. And who was Shafia? I mean, her name was Shafia. I, this is how I was going to start, and, and Shafia, and I'm going to show you Shafi'a, this is another Mfatta plate, and I will tell you more about this. Uh, this is a family picture. This is uh, from the 1940s. This is my dad here, uh, and this is my grandmother, and this is my grandmother's sister here leaning, and this is Shafi'a. Sorry about the quality of the picture. I apologize. But Shafi'a was uh, my dad's aunt. So we called her Khalti Shafi'a. And she lived in Asas. And she really lived, uh, you know, she was, she was poor. Like it seems like she, she didn't marry someone who treated her very well. Her kids were, you, you know, they were busy with their own lives. She was kind of by herself. And, and she would, during Ramadan, she would come and stay with us. Uh, you know, she used to come and spend a couple of days with us during Ramadan every year. And, uh, and of course, she loved my dad, like Ibn Ikhti, you know, her nephew, and, and he would like, you know, pamper her and so on. And, she, and of course, whenever she came, my dad would ask her for these complicated Beiruti dishes that come from, <laughs> that come from his uh, childhood. And one of them was Mfatta. Uh, and Shafi'a really, like for me as a kid, she spoke in this very heavy Beiruti accent. She, every word, every sentence would start with wa'e, wa'e shbek, wa'e, wa'e. And me as a kid looking, hearing Shafi'a, and she had this, this hair that was, I, I think she had it dyed, but it was a very poor dye, you know, like oxygenated water, so... It, and it was frizzy. I mean, she really, she was almost, there's something abject f 
for that little child looking at this, at this woman, who is she? Where is she coming from? When, when us, us, you know, I mean, coming to Sanai, I mean, she was, she was associated, she was not only coming from the past, but almost she was the past herself. It was the past, it was a certain kind of old Beiruti identity with all its accents and, and all what it represses in the name of being a modern Beiruti, of being a, a modern Muslim Beiruti family that speaks French and English and all these things. And here's this thing that's coming that is really like, like the yellow trace of Mfatta that is as heavy as Mfatta and that really embodies Mfatta. And Shafi'a would come and, and, you know, start making these dishes, khabisa, which is, which is this dish made with, uh, you know, with uh, rose water and, and walnuts and, and sprinkled with, with pomegranate seed. And of course, uh, mfatta, which is this dish that is made with tahin, tahini uh, and sugar and, and, and rice. And, and pine nuts, and it took hours and hours and hours to, to make, because first you had to soak the rice, and then you have to stir, because if you don't stir constantly, it will, it will stick to the bottom of the pan. And so it was really a communal dish. Everyone had to come and stir. The mfatta, if you really crave mfatta, you have to work for it. You have to burn your fingers for it. So it was not only uh, the, the, the dish uh, was itself kind of a sadomasochistic ritual being performed in the house that everyone had to partake in it. And you have to work for it if, if you really want it. And you distribute it to people and so on. So I started thinking, I started doing my research, just where I put my academic hat on, and I said, okay, let's see where this, is this fatah coming from, what is the history of it? Of course, a lot of this history, like a lot of Beirut history, at least a certain kind of Beirut, is, is very folkloric, you know, it's very hearsay, it's, you know, some mukhtar or, or some professor somewhere pretending to know something about food, but everyone seems to agree that Mfatta was made to commemorate uh, the story of the prophet Job, Ayyub. The prophet from the Old Testament who was, who was uh, tested by God, who, who, who embodies the sadomasochism of monotheistic religions. It is about Satan telling Jehovah, yeah, you think this, this servant of yours, Job, loves you so much. He loves you because you give him all this money, you give him all, these, all this cattle because his kids are doing well. I will show you if I take away his cattle, if I strike him with disease, he will curse you in a minute. So it's this, it's this uh, uh, bet, you know, between Job and, and, and God about about between Satan and God, about the extent to which Job loved God unconditionally, love God and believes in him unconditionally. Of course, I'm thinking here of Trading Places, that movie with, uh, <laughs> uh, about Wall Street and, uh, okay, I can't think of the actors right now. Eddie Murphy, <laughs> Eddie Murphy. So, so, so the, so fat uh, is, is, is really to, served at uh, this, this, this uh, commemoration of Job, which in, it's called Arba Ayyub, or the last Wednesday of April, which is this kind of a spring ritual, uh, in Beirut. Because it is thought that Job, that the prophet Job, uh, swam or, or, or healed from his trials, because at the end he was stricken with leprosy. Uh, healed from his trial uh, at the beach at the coast of Beirut. Of course, I later discovered that every Mediterranean city, Latakia, Harish, they all have the same uh, version that actually Job came and swam at the coast and this is where you know he washed in the water and that's how he healed at the end. So, so Arba Ayyub really is a commemoration of, of Job where the Beirutis would, would make him fatah and go and picnic 
uh, Trump to Baida, of course, there are some versions that say uh, Shuran, you know, Raushe. There are some local historians who say Uza'i, which also was a traditional beach uh, south of the city. So, so really the coast of the city. And they would make him fatah and distribute it. It was really like kind of a communal ritual. And, and it is said that Job swam under seven waves and washed seven times under seven waves to, to, to heal. And of course, we think of Beirut, the seven gates and the seven families. So little by little, this, you know, her name was Shafi'a, thinking about my, my childhood. All of a sudden, I end up understanding or thinking more about Beirut and this coast. And Beirut, of course, when we think of I love life slogan, <laughs> right, of Beirut, uh, it's a city that is dedicated to the most sadomasochistic episode in the Old Testament. It's a city that is dedicated to Job. And the whole city dwellers would go out of the gate and go and spend the day, of course the Beirutis were not mourning and, and doing anything terrible, they were having fun commemorating Job. So here, there is I love, I love life, but I love life that is associated with is a sadomasochistic ritual that tie, them, that tie them to God and that tie them to each other. So for me this is, of course, on the one hand, there is a contradiction, right? There is a contradiction, like this, this, this painful episode, this, this, this most uh, painful episode from the Bible, which is also about salvation, is so much about pain, so much about a form of, of, of trials that, that in fact are really embodies. That is, again, this notion of suffering for it, to, to, to enjoy it at the end. So, so, so what is this, how can this allow us to think of community? How does this kind of dish and what it represents, what it embodies about the city, but of course we can't just link, situate it in the city, we can think about it in relation to other cities in the region. Have we given up on those sadomasochistic rituals that really brought us together in some way? Or are we really unable to give up on these sadomasochistic rituals, but they have taken different shapes and forms? Have we replaced the deal and, and the, the kind of, uh, the, uh, the tempting of, of Job by Satan, the deal between Satan and Jehovah by some more regional powers today? Have we replaced Jehovah by some tyrant to the north or to the south? Uh, are we always, is, is, is this yellow stain that in fact leaves? And of course here, I'm thinking of the stain if you look at the plate, it's always stained after Fatah. It's hard to take it out. Is this stain with us? Of course, the stain, uh, if we think of Christianity, macula peccatum, you know, the original stain. The stain, uh, in, in the Muslims have it too. It's called al-alaqa sauda. In French, they call it le grumeau noir, which is this idea that there is a black stain that we are born with. And somehow, in all the prophet, uh, biographies, you have this idea that somehow God has taken out that grumeau noir, that alaq sauda away from the prophet because that's a way of kind of cleaning them or erasing. Is this stain a certain traumatic rem remainder? And here I go to the Deridian remainder, I go to the rest, the, the leftover that, that continues to pull us, to tie us down, but also to tie us together. It is that which conditions our subjectivity in some way, our freedom, but also that which ties us to a particular community from which we can never be untied. So, so it is precisely this makeup of political subjectivity, of the relation to power that I would like to think about through food. And of course, here, I, I kind of go to uh, 
To think about the way community and political community has been imagined, I want to go to one of Rana and I's favorite interlocutor uh, is Ahmad Faris al-Shidya, who, uh, who was in London in the 1850s. And al-Shidya is telling his wife, al-Faryaqiyya, this is in Saq al saq he's telling his wife that in 1850s London, he's telling her you have to, you know, learn English, you can't continue to, you know, we have to really kind of try to fit in here. And she says, so here, the community, what we see is sepk, 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 which means to mint, minting, like sepk, uh, minting money, right? And siyaga, so what we, are, what we are dealing with are metals, we are dealing with our metaphors from the industrial age. We are dealing with metallurgy as a way of thinking the community. And even when we, you know, today, or we used to talk about, let's say, New York as the melting pot, or the United States as the melting pot, is what kind of melting is it? Is it a melting of metals, or is it, is mfat'a, does mfat'a? give us a different language to think about community? Does it, is in fact a trace where the melting is not complete, where we are not dealing with metals, we are also dealing with pudding-like textures. Does that both save us and tie us down? Does that keep us stuck in the sadomasochistic rituals that we reproduce, or does that allow us to break free from them at the same time. So what, what I want to think about really, I mean, of course, when we think of modernity, when we think of what Shidya saw in England in the 1850s and, and 1860s, and that will eventually translate into nationalist projects throughout the region, nation state where we talk about Sahar, again, this notion of Sahar, which means this kind of integration, this, this kind of becoming part of the one same body. But it seems fat is, is, is not based on this melting and, and the sahar. And, and what we see in fat and this is, if you can see it here, there is a coagulation that happens in fat The fat is done when the dish, when the oil comes to the surface. You know, when there is something called it means there is an oil, there is a coagulation. So this, the mfatta is done not based on a total unity of its different ingredients. There is something that remains other, that remains separate within that dish itself. So this melting, the sahr, this the siyaha is not complete. It doesn't produce one identity, one product. It, this identity, this product is always ripped, is always ripped. And this is where, how do we think of this rip again as something that is not only uh, in, in the kind of orientalist fashion, tying us to a cycle of repetition where we just replace Jehovah by whoever is around and who has power, but how do we all also find ways see the strip as, as, a, as, an, as an exit, as a way, to th as a possibility to think outside of this model of modernity that we either abide by or fall short of. How do we think of the nation state as the ideal model that requires total equality and a total coming together of the different ingredients to make the one, and how not to think about it, uh, how to uphold difference, how to uphold separation within this notion of community. And upholding the separation, upholding this kind of coagulation that comes with Mfat uh, is also tied to these kind of sadomasochistic rituals that we have to understand, think about, and, and, and think of our relation with. And, and here, I, I want to kind of end with uh, by invoking another one of our interlocutors who also thought about Job, thought about Ayub, and thought about Ayub in this very place, at this very table, a couple of years ago, and this is Huda Barakat. 
the Lebanese author, who gave a talk here about Ayyub, about Job. And at the time, I didn't understand why Huda is going to Ayyub uh, as a metaphor and, and, until I you know, started thinking about food and, and discovered Ayyub myself and Ayyub's you know, fundamental importance to the history of Beirut and also to the history of this region in general. And, and this is where I go to Huda to think about this. Ayyub alladhi hukima wa lam yus'al bada kharij muhakamatih yakad yakun ghair ma'ani biha tabi'a ayyub qanun nafsahu fabarra'aha ma qabla ma qabila bihi lam yakun istislama nuqil naqala ayyub ma'rakatahu ila haythu quwwatih fi dhatihi alwahida wal farida and this is again, of course, we can think of Sisyphus in the, in the, in the, in the myth, in, in Camus' reading of Sisyphus, as also the possibility of freedom in the trial, as the possibility of freedom in, in consciousness, in consciousness. And this is the possibility where we can think outside, where, where we can exploit if you like, our kind of sadomasochism, but at the same time think outside of this, this Western, this project of modernity that we either have or don't have, that we either fulfill entirely or completely fall short of. And I will end on this point. Thank you. Thank you, Tariq, for this very animated uh, and inspiring talk. We now move to uh, Deepa Basti, who's coming all the way from Bangalore, from the Four Arger Collective. Uh, the Four Arger Collective is a fluid group of writers and artists uh, in, uh, interested in investigating shifting forms of politics, culture, physical geographies, and socioeconomic structures in the contemporary world. They participate in experimental, cross-cultural, and interdisciplinary collaborations with artists, writers, and curators, uh, and other creative uh, practitioners in both digital and physical spaces. They are the founders of the Four Arger Magazine, a quarterly online journal of the on the politics of food. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Sorry. So, uh, yesterday was, uh, so my colleague is also here. So yesterday was our second day uh, in Beirut, and something happened that was very relevant to what I want to talk about. So yesterday, we were invited uh, to what we were told was a woman's only, sort of like a salon kind of uh, uh, thing at somebody's house. But um, I wasn't feeling very uh, well last night, and so ended up canceling it. And then this morning I woke up and I, there was not even the slightest hint of uh, you know how tired and miserable I was feeling yesterday. And then I was, I, I, I told myself, okay, there is this you know element of uh, doubt whether I was actually feeling uh, as tired as I thought I was. And there was also a very deep regret. And that to me was you know very relevant because I'm here today to talk about the idea of the day after, which is, uh, you know, the day after it could be some, like last night, a day after something that did not happen. Or if we had gone, I'm sure I would have had a very different story to talk about uh, today. So the day after is something that uh, uh, the, the philosopher Slavoj Žižek has been talking about a lot um, on and off. He talks about how, Sure, you know, there is, there is a Sunday and there is some protest about something that is probably happening in all our countries. And then we might like something on Facebook or we might join an online protest or actually go out to the town square and join the protest and hold some placards and uh, come back. And then the Sunday is over and on Monday morning we go back to our own routine lives. So he 
ask this question about our fascination with the event itself and not what happens the day after. So what happens after the protests are over and after the placards are put away and the candles are blown out. So this, the idea that you wake up the next morning and the repercussions of what happened the previous day is something that you are left to kind of deal with and to question and to sort of ask yourself, okay, what are you going to do next? And this is something that the Forager Collective has been thinking about a lot as well, because while, of course, the revolt, and I use the word revolt for everything, it could be a dinner party from the previous night or the salon that I did not go to yesterday, or even a larger revolution that might be happening in various countries around the world. While that is, of course, important, the next morning you wake up and how are you going to deal with the mess or, you know, or otherwise of whatever happened the previous night. And these impacts may be positive, may be negative, depending on who you're asking, who, who is looking at this uh, particular question. So I think the, the, something that we have been thinking about a lot is how is normal life going to change the day after, or if it is even going to change in the first place. The enthusiasm of the protest, uh, once that is spent, what are you left with? And uh, there's, there's a line that uh, he talks about, about how if there is a revolt but there is no revolution that follows it, then is there an act of true violence where the act of true violence is something that changes the very basic infrastructure of the society. It could be a change in the uh, social structure, it could be change in the way the ranks of society are sort of defined and understood, or whatever change. So that is the idea of the true violence that happens. And to tie that in with the, the other thing that I want to talk about today is uh, the leftover food. Um, I'm sure you, know, you all also have this idea of making something else with the food that is left over. So in India, India is a, it's a big country, and we have very, very different uh, cuisines uh, all, over, all over the country. But I come from this uh, South Indian state called Karnataka, and we have uh, our staple food is rice. So we use a lot of rice in pretty much everything. And in most households, uh, we always used to, I grew up in a very small town, and we used to make a lot of extra rice because there was always people passing by who would just stop by, it was just sort of understood. If you came home between a certain time, between, uh, you know, you were expected to be fed. Uh, they expected uh, you to feed them either lunch or dinner, so there would always be, uh, you know, extra food. The basics would always be there. And obviously, possibly in the 60s or 70s, this happened a lot more than it happens now. Nowadays, everybody either texts or calls before they come, so you know if someone's going to stay. So there would always be extra rice, and I'm sure in different parts of the country it would be uh, different dishes. So, and the next morning, uh, our mothers would make it into something else, and that would be the lunch for that day's uh, you know, uh, school day. Or it could be the breakfast that was served this morning. So there's this uh, entire culture that revolves around food that is left over from the previous, uh, previous day. And it's fascinating because uh, throughout, to me, the idea of the leftover food, whether you use it or not in the first place, is very indicative of your financial status. So uh, in the 1930s or you know, around that time, during the Great Depression, housewives in the U.S. were encouraged to think of it as a very challenging uh, thing. And, you know, and um, I was reading, you know, we read this article where everything from okra to, uh, to pieces of pastry to every single thing that was in the house was mixed in a big pot and baked into a pie. It doesn't sound very appetizing, but then that was the way they dealt with it, and they were seen as this very patriotic uh, uh, people if uh, they ate something which was not really very tasty, but they used up everything. So waste not, want not was something that was very encouraged. And past the depression, when things began 
uh, you know, getting better financially, it was seen as a very uh, prestigious thing to tell people that they were throwing away food because also food began to be much more uh, inexpensive than it used to be. So people were throwing away food and they took pride in saying that they were throwing away food because it meant, it showed to the, uh, to the world that they were rich enough to be able to do so. And that is something that, so while, so the, throughout history, you know, leftover food has been both celebrated and sort of really uh, seen as this very shameful thing where you no longer eat uh, leftover food because it's not good enough. If that was the more sort of the global thing, in India we have another very important element that is added on to it. It's that of the caste and the community. So for those of you who are not very familiar, so India has this uh, um, very loosely based sort of four castes, four main castes, which are very, very uh, you know important for Indian uh, politics especially. So. Whereas earlier, before uh, we became a British colony and much earlier, it was something that you could choose to be. So there was the, uh, the Brahmins, the uh, Kshatriyas who were the warrior class. The Brahmins were the priestly, the educated uh, class. Then there was the Vaishyas who were uh, the merchant class and then the Shudras who were more the working class. And over time, for the past 200 to 250 years, it has become extremely rigid. So if you're, if you're born into a caste, you can never change it. You can probably change your uh, religion from being a Hindu to a Muslim or a Christian or something else, but you can never change a caste. And uh, the leftover food has a very important role to play in this uh, caste and community thing because no matter how rich you might be or how not so rich. They, we have this culture where one is that the guests are not fed uh, leftover food because we have this philosophy of uh, Atiti Devo Baba, which means that uh, guests, uh, God comes to your house in the form of a guest. So how you treat your guests is indirectly how you would be treating God. So you have to, it just means that you have to treat the guests really, really well and you know feed them good food and all that. So. There's this uh, thing where no matter how closely related you might, the, that guest might be to you to, and your family, you would never serve them uh, the leftover food, no matter how uh, uh, tasty it is or it, if you couldn't afford it, you borrowed from the neighbor's house and made them fresh food. So, and neither is leftover food uh, served uh, during weddings or you know, other auspicious uh, feasts. But where the caste thing comes in is, uh, is where there was this, uh, uh, this, this I, I, I'm sure it exists in some parts of the country uh, even now where workers, it's a very uncomfortable word, but servants is still used very extensively. Um, so these servants would be served the food that was left over from what the uh, their employers uh, ate. So there was the whole feudal system where even, you know, Though officially we never use the word slavery, slavery has existed in various forms in India as well. And these slaves were fed in, in and, and a lot of times they were served the same plantain leaf. The banana leaf was used as uh, food plates uh, a lot in India. So the same uh, plantain leaves would, whatever was left over on the leaf would be given to, the serv to, to these uh, workers and they had to scrape food from it and eat from that. And uh, this is something that, um, so now it is no longer politically correct to call them shudras. So there's a word, uh, so the lower castes are called the Dalits. And there's a lot of Dalit writing which comes in, um, which is coming in, and a lot of them refer to this food angle. How there is, uh, you know, there was, most of the times there was a lack of food, more than there being any presence of food, and which is very disturbing because a lot of times, these were the people who were cultivating the uh, landlord's lands and they were growing the grains and the rice or vegetables or whatever, but then they would always be fed the scraps and leftovers of, uh, of the food. And the other uh, thing which is sort of, if that was being controlled by the employers, and there's also another larger, 
and to me personally more disturbing sense of control by the government which is happening a lot right now. So there are two things. That we have a public distribution system where uh, food grains and uh, sugar and other groceries are given by a government uh, control system to people within a certain uh, economic bracket at highly subsidized uh, prices. So these, um, and obviously what, uh, a couple of years ago in my home state of Karnataka, they, uh, the government uh, announced uh, that they would give uh, one kilo of, one kilogram of rice, which is our staple food, uh, for ru uh, one rupee uh, per kilo. And that is, I'm not sure how much that is, in, it, that's very, very, very little. So, um, so it, it was, for, for a lot of people, of course, it was a very uh, convenient thing, but then what was not really talked about was in, in certain parts of the state, uh, rice was just something that they ate maybe twice or thrice a year as a, as a treat. It was not a staple food at all, and they, were, they used to eat uh, corn and uh, different kinds of millets. So here what was happening is that the government was trying to regulate, trying to control what people ate, and I think uh, it is well accepted that how your access to food or lack thereof is what leads to a lot of control. And if you're controlling somebody's food, you're controlling how they behave, how they uh, live, how you know the culture is developed or not developed. So this has been happening uh, quite a lot. There was a lot of hue and cry, and it was interesting that they kind of increased the prices of uh, these millets and corn, where while again reducing the cost of uh, the, the price of rice so poor, you know people who couldn't afford prices uh, food at regular prices were kind of forced to change their entire food habits and that obviously translated to health issues because they had no idea what you know how to kind of counter the highly carb uh, high carb uh, diets and the other thing which is extremely, uh, you know, debated right now in India is the beef issue. Again, a way that the government is trying to control what people uh, uh, are eating. Because um, in India, uh, it's, it's the, we call it the myth of the holy cow. Because uh, there's this narrative, uh, and like in several countries of the world, we have a highly, uh, you know, extreme right-wing government uh, at the center right now. And the narrative that the cow is a very holy animal and uh, Hindus, which make up the majority of uh, the country, do not eat uh, beef is something that is becoming very popular. And it's very disturbing because it is uh, very well documented that people right from the Vedic times, um, uh, Hindus are supposed to derive their religious tenants from the uh, from the Vedas, which are said to be some 5,000 years old or something. So it's documented there as to how people used to eat beef, and it was just another meat. It was not, you know, it was not holy or anything. But here what's happening is me, uh, beef is the cheapest of uh, all meats that's available in, in, in all over the country. And uh, now the uh, slaughtering cows is uh, illegal. In fact, it's just, it's reached such, it's always been illegal in some uh, states. But uh, there is this vigilante groups that are becoming very popular called uh, um, Gorakshaks, which translate to uh, cow protectors, quite literally. So they go around and uh, it's, it's become that bad so that, you know, they might look at you, if, if they don't like your face, they can just say that, you are uh, suspected of hoarding, uh, of storing beef in your house and kill you. And it's actually happening, as disturbing as it sounds. Uh, so there have been a lot of beef-related uh, deaths in um, India in the last uh, two, three years. And you know, the, I, the mainstream media is barely talking about it. So these, um, so these, means of state control of uh, food is also something which is which is very uh, which is something that we think about a lot and uh, to me that is this whole paradox of uh, forced choices where the community and here by the community it could be your caste it could be the community uh, the the larger society or the government itself how 
they are they give you this illusion that you have the freedom to choose anything that you want to eat uh, whatever that you want but as long as you are choosing what they want you to choose then it's all right if you choose something else then you're kind of denied that uh, freedom to choose in the first place so there's this entire paradox of uh, forced choices where i think we all live in this illusion that okay it's because it's a democracy we have all these grand choices unlimited choices but uh, it's actually not not the case at all and uh, the other thing i wanted to talk about was um, taking off from uh, mikhail vaktin's uh, the grotesqueness of uh, uh, you know of the market as well where there is this even even now i mean pro possibly it is I, I know I'm kind of taking the easy way out and blaming everything on the government, uh, on the existing government uh, in India, but there is this uh, thing that if you belong to a certain group right now in uh, India, anything is possible, anything is uh, allowed. And uh, that, that sentiment, I think, is being kind of exploited uh, a lot. So, and... Uh, uh, kind of going back to the idea of uh, leftover food if you are kind of uh, you know there is this even when you look at the carnivalesque idea it is something it is a situation where something is possible uh, to be masked and everything becomes equal where a carnivalesque uh, environment excuse me, <coughs> excuse me environment where everything is possible or uh, you know, all ranks and all communities and all uh, uh, castes become uh, equal without any uh, sort of hierarchies. Much as I want to be, I think, uh, optimistic about that situation uh, happening at some point in India, I highly doubt it because maintaining hierarchies, uh, you know, amongst, amongst communities and uh, castes is something which is very... Uh, comfortable for a lot of political parties. And um, the, uh, uh, the, the other thing is, uh, you know, on one hand, there is this whole idea of uh, uh, the government controlling what um, people are eating and what their access to uh, certain kinds of food. And then there's also this whole uh, idea which I'm sure is happening here as well in, as in uh, just like in other countries this whole um, sort of hipster ideas of what uh, how sustainably you can eat where everything is becoming you know if you can afford it um, again the question of affordability is a big thing here uh, a big, big thing in, in this thing where if you can afford it you would rather eat organic or you would rather eat uh, locally uh, grown uh, produce and those kind of hipster ideas where there's also this um, i am not very sure if uh, the idea of the dumpster diving uh, exists in india uh, it it could where this dumpster diving is very popular in the west where uh, apparently there are lots of these uh, uh, kind of hipster group which is uh, interested in sustainability and being environmentally conscious where they go uh, and uh, look into uh, waste paper uh, uh, dustbins and pick up things from there to eat because the, the a lot of supermarkets there uh, dump the food as is without kind of uh, you know disposing it off in any other way so if you go behind uh, you know, to the alleys behind uh, supermarkets, there are a lot of uh, food that you can pick up from uh, these uh, dustbins. So there, are, there is this whole, you know, movement, and there are also chefs right now, all these celebrity chefs like uh, Jamie Oliver or, uh, you know, the other, uh, um, Nigella Lawson or so where they have started kind of popularizing the idea of uh, the leftover food because I think that is something that we all understand. Some, there are certain dishes which taste much better if they are two or three days old, like stews or soup or, you know, something versus if they are served just as and when, you know, just after they have been cooked. So these hipster ideas of what, you know, of... I mean, I don't want to dismiss them as just hipster, but then 
there are also these, uh, some of these ideas are things that we have culturally known for a long time. The idea of sustainability and, uh, uh, you know, these using what was made something else uh, uh, the previous day. And, um, but again, when we talk about sustainability in food, uh, it's, it's again a very uh, sort of slightly uncomfortable uh, topic for us who, who come from India because if you're thinking of dumpster diving and all these things being cool now and something that people should aspire to do, it is for a lower caste person in India, this is, some, this is something that has been their reality and it is something that they have kind of uh, experienced and something that they want to remove from their uh, memories because for them it has been leftover food and however sustainable or otherwise it might be is something that very representative of the decades and generations of uh, uh, you know, subjugation and sort of insult that has been heaped upon, uh, upon them. So again, to kind of go back to the idea of the day after, there is this, if you're, for, for somebody from looking at the entire caste system in India, there is hunger and then there is the idea of, you know, food not being there the lack of food. So if uh, hunger is this kind of revolt, then there is also this whole uh, revolution where they have access to food now and they have an awareness of how leftover food can be used, but then they're also uncomfortable with the revolution of being you know, sustainable in their food habits because of the memories uh, that they might carry from, from their communities or from their uh, from the memories of their ancestors. So I want to end with, uh, you know, asking a couple of questions because this is not something that I seek a resolution for, but I think the first question is that if there is leftover food and food is again some, you know, and here when I talk about food, it's the both the food that we eat and the food for thought as well, you know. First question is, what do you do with the leftover food? So that, that's the first question that, how do you turn it into something that may be aesthetically pleasing as well as, uh, you know, edible and uh, sustainable and all those things. And the other is, what happens when we kind of begin to try and cook extra every day just because we want to have uh, excess uh, food the next day. So those, these two questions and also if there is, if we are making extra food just because we want to change, you know, want there to be this violent act of trying to change something that is very basic in society, then kind of how do you resolve, how do we ask, how do we answer uh, this question to ourselves? And lastly, you know, this, I again, the idea of the grotesque. So we all have our own little carnivals in, you know, going on in our uh, communities and our society. So how grotesque is, you know, are these carnivals that, uh, that we have going on in our lives? Thank you. Thank you, Deepa. Um, I have a couple of questions before I give the floor to you. Um, I, I was wondering to what extent is the aftermath food? So uh, the aftermath of all these uh, disasters and catastrophes that, uh, that befall Ayyub. Um, and then uh, and thinking through the so thinking, thinking uh, Deepa's uh, uh, intervention through the Mfat'a, taking the Mfat'a as uh, a model of thinking what happens, how are we going to deal with the aftermath? I, mostly, I, I think mostly of disasters and famines and uh, the, putting a per, uh, people uh, uh, exercising uh, sieges on food so that you ha make people do submit to your will, these sorts of uh, acts uh, that take place. So. Could it be possible to think that uh, what, these people that you're calling hipsters, 
that by going to the garbage dump and taking the food from there, they are actually vindicating lower class memory and lower cl class practices. So instead of thinking of them as just being hipster, fashionable, trendy, in fact, trying to forge a community with these people uh, that, that goes beyond, that takes, uh, into account the violence that is being, uh, that they have been dealt with across history and asking them for more uh, sustainable practices as well, asking them to work together with those hipsters uh, for more sustainable political practices. And then Tare, I was thinking, I was thinking of us, us, okay? Us, us is itself, I mean, she lives in the us, us. Yeah, she lives in the, in the scissors and she lives in the, uh, Shafia lives in, in the place where, where things get cut, cut, cut. Yes, that's what us, us is. It's the cut, cut. And it's the, yes, it's, uh, so she's the, the woman who makes them fatta, who is the cut, cut. Uh, and I'm wondering, you know, we've, we've talked about this before. Um, the, the boys that go and swim on Ain Lemreisi. Could they be the Ayubs today? I mean, they, they have, in, in a sense, they have, where is them? I would like to recuperate them fatta to them because they have, uh, they go swim in the leprosy of the city. So the entire uh, sewers of the city go to Han Lemreisi. And it's disgusting, really. It's so disgusting. But they go every single day. I've been swimming with them sometimes. It's impossible. I mean, you have to close your mouth because you really don't know. You're going to drink the shit of that city. And cielo. It's actually, sometimes it's cielo, the water, as well. It's kind of fatta-like. Uh, what is Iman? Iman was talking. We can't talk about shit and food in the same... We, but we can, exactly, we should talk about them. So uh, it's not a question, but more of a comment, an association that I'm sure will throw you into a, a new web of associations. Okay. All right. Uh, first, I want to... This is great, Rana, thank you. Uh, first, I want to start with Mfat'a as the afterlife to kind of connect. Uh, of course, in, in Totem and Taboo, Freud uh, reads the community or the basis of the community is in the afterlife. It's when you have this autocratic father who has all the women and the sons plot and kill the father and they eat him. And that act is the, the kind of foundational act of the community because what comes out of that act first is you shall never kill your father, <laughs> but also uh, guilt and ethics, basically. Guilt from having killed the father and guilt as the foundation of the ethics that makes up the community. So in some sense, the very notion of community is based on this after, you know, you know what we did when we were to, uh, yeah. Uh, so that's, that's one thing. And, and also I think this is very important because we're kind of seeing, to come back to Christine's opening remark, which really moved me. I mean, we, we are living the return and the legitimacy of this autocratic father. It is no longer uh, a myth like in the Oedipal model, or it is, it is no longer, but, but, it's, but it, it is becoming re-legitimized as a political reality that conditions our subjectivity and that we have to accept it and undo the kind of all kinds of enlightenment projects. I'm not talking only about the European enlightenment projects, but any form of space outside of that kind of sadomasochistic relation where you can think of the Leviathan and Hobbes, you can think of a number of political models that require sacrifice, think of Abraham, right? I mean, that requires sacrifice and so on. So what I'm thinking of Mfatta making is, is 
and also in the day after, is it a way to to deal with, to contain, to 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 critique, to open possibilities, to uh, outside of this sadomasochistic relation to power? Is it a way of thinking the community as being able, as having a particular agency to also say, I can deal with this and I'm not reduced to this. So I'm not reduced to Job. I can find rituals that also allows me to go to Ramtul Baida and have fun and fly kites and, and not just simply reenact the pain and the trauma of Job. So is it a way of dealing with the traumatic and a way to open up a possibility for a space outside of the sadomasochistic relation? The Orientalist reading would say, no, you continue to reenact the same thing, the same thing, the Orient doesn't change, and so on. So this is where Mfat'a acknowledges the sadomasochism, it doesn't do away with it, it doesn't erase it. There is a trace, the yellow trace, that continues with Ain Limraisi and Ramat al -Baida. And the kids that are doing it are also maybe continuing that ritual. This is a beautiful association, I don't know. That, that, but it's also these kind of young people who are doing it as a way of continuing that ritual and insisting and on the possibility of breaking or, or finding ways, finding rips through which they plunge and emerge, like the oil emerging from the bottom of the pot. Um, no, just to take off from uh, you know what you said, this the, the the stain that remains is something that is you know very much as I would like you know hipsters to kind of uh, sort of build that community and talk about you know the identities in a sort of a subversive sub, uh, subversive way. I think what they do falls under the realm of the the you know not wanting to waste the food. Uh, this idea of there's so much of, uh, I think about uh, in developed countries, there's some 40% of the food that's produced is just wasted. It's just thrown into, uh, you know, the, the, the dustbins and not used at all. Whereas when it comes to the lower caste people, I think what they identify with is, I mean, it's, it's a much more complicated system, much as, you know, food is just one of the things that they would be talking about. So, whereas this community might be working, there, there might be all these, uh, you know, urban educated uh, communities which might be working towards uh, trying not to uh, waste food and trying to be sustainable in their food habits. For these, uh, the lower caste people, it becomes an, just another way of kind of, uh, you know, control because they see eating leftover foods or something that is reminiscent of, uh, you know, so there's nothing being done to kind of erase their, erase the caste system itself. It is just intervening in these small little pockets, which to them, I assume, would not be of much importance. <laughs> Questions? Um, after hearing like several talks about food and, and the investigation of food as a topic, um, it, I, I can see that it can go into two different directions. One is like, the investigation of food itself to find um, more information or missing links between uh, traditions or cultures, um, or the investigation of food as a metaphor or, or as a frame of like, understanding uh, par parallel traditions or parallel behavior or uh, or reframing other things and in the latter uh, like the question is like is there a danger in using food as a metaphor to kind of recreate or understand things other than they are or is it a means of creativity that can actually help us understand things in a new way or find um, missing gaps or perhaps both I this is a question for... 
I mean, I don't see that, um, you know, for me, uh, at least my investigation here is, is really about the practice. It's about ritual. I mean, of course, it involves a metaphorical level, and I played on this notion of the stain. This is the metaphorical part, if you like. But that's a metaphor that is very meaningful and is part of the ritual. I mean, from Christianity, the original stain, right? I mean, this is, this is a very vibrant thing and present. But I agree with you that we need to think of practices. I mean, you know, food also in terms of making and eating as, 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 a, pra as a praxis, you know, as a form of, as a ritualistic form of production, a community, uh, political subjectivity, you name it. So, so it's very important to kind of not to reify, not to objectify, uh, food as part of a discourse on tradition or culture. And that's why I started by saying, you know, I cannot access this outside of a personal also practice, you know, I mean, in my case. Uh, so I, I kind of distanced myself from the position of the researcher who just kind of observes and analyzes from a distance. So, so you have to put yourself also in you know, at, at, the, at the center of this. Uh, I'm also interested in affects, but that's another kind of question altogether. But I mean, of course, it's linked to that. Uh, actually, I wonder if your Shafi'a is the same of my Shafi'a, I don't know because of the different in age. Um, uh, Shafi'a, uh, of my Shafi'a, she, she was the mother of my uncle's wife. And she lives in Asas. Okay, <laughs> this is coincident. But because, because of the different of your age and my age, I don't know if it is the same Shafi'a or not. <laughs> this is one. Secondly, always Shafi'a, when she visit us, it will be the day of Mfatta, and it is a Mfatta celebration. So, so, so this is this is coincident. But you, uh, you, uh, it, it, you call me. It is uh, it is called all my childhood. I remember everything. When you are talking, I think you are talking about me. So this is, <laughs> to me, it is surprising. It is surprising. I have. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Abshad Badani. But you know, I mean, I think this is, but this is also like the, the essay I wrote for Tamawish for the, this also circulated and people were commenting on it and also Say, identifying and telling their stories. And so there is something, again, about this notion of the rip, of the fetter, of this opening, that not only in terms of how we theorize this and think about this, but also in terms of identification, because this is also what you just said. Yeah, and of course, it, it's probably a coincidence, but it's also an, an identification that, that makes th that community continue in some way even through, uh, through these forms of, of recognition or of self-recognition. Um, but yeah, I mean, and they, you know, the, 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 the Delia group, the, the, the group that is protesting against the dis destruction of the Delia and Sakhar Tarawshi also did them fat a day and, you know, so the, I mean, the, there is definitely something that kind of moves and connects and, and it creates these, uh, these, these forms of identification. So I'm very, I'm, yeah, I mean, I had nothing to say, really. Yeah, thank you very much for both talks, which I really appreciated. I come from Germany and I have another observation on food practices in Germany, because I have the impression that in the younger generations, they are very much linked to subjectivation processes and to forms of becoming particular, becoming identical, and so forth. Uh, 
Therefore, I would like to know your experiences concerning the differences of generations. In Germany, the youngsters do not only this kind of uh, dump, how do you call it? <laughs> Dumpster diving. Dumpster yeah. diving. Yeah. But they mainly do their noodles nowadays themselves. They buy machines in order not to participate in the capitalist production of food. This is one part of their identity politics. But on the other hand, they differentiate themselves very much into uh, meat-eating people, ve vegetarians, vegan people, and so forth. And for example, my son is uh, not happy about the fact that he cannot prepare food for his living community because everybody eats in a different manner. So community is also destroyed while wanting to bring the people together for eating rituals. So I would like to know how it is in, in your cultures, because in Germany it seems really to become difficult to eat together, because there are, is this search for self-identification through food. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely fascinating. But I think in India it's not such a big problem because uh, personally uh, I, there are very very few people who, uh, very few indians who might be vegan because we have a very rich culture of uh, you know using dairy products and it's you're either a vegetarian or you eat meat so i think uh, if i'm eating with my fa my family i'm a vegetarian and so is my family and including my extended family so but there are, I do have cousins who eat uh, meat. They might not make it at home, but they would eat, go to restaurants and uh, eat. So I think as families, we all, there are very few peop, uh, families which are very, uh, which might have these very specific dietary uh, restrictions. And I think if it is a, if it is a bigger uh, community, there's always, we always make uh, two different kinds of, there's always a meat-based dish and there's always something vegetarian. So I think given the kind of uh, food culture we have, we don't see it very much. But then I do, I, I, I do uh, can relate to you know, what you're saying because when we travel abroad, we see that a lot, especially uh, you know, last month we were in uh, the UK and there I think it is, it's really you know, kind of kicking off. One is a vegan, one, is, one eats uh, fish but nothing else. So it's very difficult to kind of cook for uh, a larger uh, group of uh, people. But uh, thankfully, we haven't seen it so much yet in uh, India, I would say. I mean, this is a, you know, this again uh, comes back to this notion of the return of the autocratic father and the rise of the right wing across the world, right? not really, and this notion of we have to bring the community back together as a response to certain forms of new communities, new forms of identifications, new rituals that we might not always recognize, but they are happening, that don't speak the same language or, or have the same practices as, as, we, de, as we do. We, you know, I, I, feel, I feel old, Hisham, I feel, yeah. <laughs> but uh, so, so, so in a way, you know, there are other forms of community. I mean, you know, in Germany, I lived in Berlin, I mean, and also you have all these different foods, uh, this variety that, so, so on the one hand, there is something very positive about this, but the kind of conservative response is to say that this is the sign of the demise of the German community, and therefore we need to come back to something in nationalist terms that recodes the community in very kind of traditional forms. This is the danger, so how do we, kind of look at the new generation and what they're doing and also try to find meaning or try to understand new forms of community making rituals that might be different from the one that has preceded them. With, because the conservative response is to say this is the demise of the community full stop. And we need to somehow, the only way to reactivate it is through a sadomasochistic relation with an authoritarian father. And this is the right wing rise in Europe, in, in this region, 
and, and across the world. So it's a response to that, but so we have to be very careful and creative in dealing with these new rituals and not simply pathologize them. Uh, one last question, Haifa. Hi, uh, so um, uh, two questions. Um, the first, uh, regarding you were talking about um, the patriarchs and the messagism and, uh, and kind of, uh, and you, in an earlier um, comment, you mentioned praxis, and I wonder if you can talk a little more about like gender when it comes to this like almost emancipatory vision of, of um, and, and like the labor of women and, and, and in preparing food and how that relates to the patriarchy in your vision of, of uh, Mfatta. And regarding dumpster diving um, and like the difference, um, the differences between um, upper middle class kids and, 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 uh, and, uh, and, and working in low uh, income uh, class families, I mean, uh, Maybe there's uh, also an element like maybe talk about is there an element of um, kind of class tourism to an extent that we see in these kinds of things, but also in like a, a re-emergence of, of, of street food as something that is kind of interesting and cool and kind of uh, um, a, re a really a re um, and. Uh, a way to deal with the guilt of, of being uh, upper middle class by almost enacting, uh, uh, you know. So maybe if there are comments on, on these both subjects. Thank you. Uh, great question. I mean, I think, of course, the food preparation and the question of gender is really, especially today you have men chef, actually. Men chef are kind of what we saw in the earlier talk with, with, with Iman. Uh, but, I mean, this is, this is a huge question, but I think w one way to think about um, fat, uh, the, my answer to Rana earlier is also to think maybe about, I mean, in, in my household, we all had to volunteer to stir. So it was kind of a cross-gender kind of practice because Shafi'a over... You know, she, she, she was the kind of grand priestess of the mfatta making, but, but all the workers really crossed gender in, 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 in that particular context. But another way, and I'm not, I haven't developed this and I haven't thought about this enough, but if we're thinking about mfatta making in the context of the afterlife, of, of, of reflecting on and dealing with and critiquing and containing the the sadomasochistic relations, I mean, this is where you think of women's role as, as the ones who are, you know, creating that opening to, to, to reflect, deal with, open up, transform, and, and critique that sadomasochistic ritual that is often, you know, dad, son, right? Jehovah, Job, you know, and the son who, how much he loves his father and how unconditional is that love. So here we can think of what I'm making as, as kind of a reflection of and critique and, and a re-signification of that relationship that might create openings and, and different possibilities of thinking community. Hi. Thank you for your question. I think there's this huge element of guilt, like you said, uh, because uh, dumpster diving, as far as I know, is not has not yet caught on as much in India as it has elsewhere. But I think there's this whole, even when it comes to the larger idea of eating locally, or if you, if you are in a city and if you want to eat local produce and organic food and all those fancy names that are attached, you have to be of a certain, uh, uh, you know, you have to have a certain kind of uh, money to do all that. But even if you kind of go back to the whole dumpster diving thing, if you're picking up food from the trash, then these are usually people who have the means of, uh, you know, being able to eat, if not in fancy restaurants, then at least in slightly, you know, middle class sort of uh, restaurants. Whereas there is no awareness that it is kind of an apology that they're kind of uh, doing. But I think in the Indian context, this idea of class is, you know, kind of uh, becomes a larger uh, issue because of how rigid and how uh, pervasive the, uh, the the caste system is. So, if you are taking up uh, taking food from the trash, then you are denying an entire family its uh, afternoon meal. So, 
while you might be kind of atoning for your guilt, you're also kind of depriving, you know, these are, these are complicated uh, questions. So I think unless the caste system is completely resolved, which I unfortunately don't see, uh, you know, happening anytime soon, I think these uh, kind of cooler things that are happening don't really have a very influential uh, intervention in uh, society, I would say. Thank you so much, uh, Tare and Zipa, for this wonderful session. And thank you all for your questions and your attendance. Thank you.